I don't know. I always tell people, I'm like, you don't need to slog around at marathon pace and all these other things. Like, have fun. Run a little bit less than you would. Head to the track. Do some 200 repeats. You know, I think a mile is a great kind of thing to train for if you're just like, I just want to be an overall kind of well-rounded athlete. This episode of the Run DNA podcast with Drew Hunter was a really fun one for me. Two reasons. Drew is just a great human being and a great runner. It's great to hear about his career, the journey that he's gone through with injury injuries, how he's going about an Olympic year. It's definitely great to hear a pro's perspective and get to get some inside information about how he's training and what he's doing. But then on the flip side, Drew and I did a little fun where I am training to run a sub five minute mile as I turn 40. And Drew actually takes me through and designs my next four weeks of training. And we go through it and he talks about his way that he goes about it. So I think everyone needs a coach and I'm going to step up and say, I, you know, present company included. So Drew is gonna coach me to this sub five minute mile. So you can follow that along and we're definitely gonna do a follow-up with this as well so lots of fun to have here uh, you can listen to it this podcast but if you have the option to go on and check it out on youtube you're going to be able to see some screen share for the second half of the podcast it might be good just to see what it looks like and see the workouts as they get put into the app so enjoy Hey everyone, Doug Adams here with Run DNA Podcast. Very excited to have Drew Hunter on with us today here. So I um, just really appreciate you being here, Drew. I want to give a little quick intro. Uh, you know, Drew is basically, I consider like the Kobe Bryant of running, uh, basically in 2016, he started off in high school, um, broke the mile record. That was like 357.81, if I'm remembering right there. That so. Right. That sounds about right there. So, um, you know, that was back in 2016. And then, like, really just came onto the scene strong. I think one of my all time favorite races to watch was Penn Relays, where you had that huge come from behind victory uh, in the in the uh, relay there, where you ran the mile anchor leg and just completely ran like, you know, there was nobody else existing in the world. It was really cool to watch there. That was that was a lot of fun. So, and then I, were you? Were you the first or at least one of the first to ever sign as a professional runner coming directly out of high school? Yeah, one of the first. There's a few sprinters who did it, but uh, distance runners, not as common. And so not uh, as much there. Big difference. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, I mean, just um, obviously a, a really uh, big deal in the running community here, but, uh, you know, also generally just one of the nicest people I know. And and uh, Drew is somebody I've been um, very fortunate to get to know over the past five or six, five or six years. Uh, now we've gotten to know each other and, um, you know, now a, a father and a husband and it got to know him on a personal level there, to, but few people that you'll ever meet as caring and uh, just genuine of a person as, as Drew. So um, I am very excited to have Drew on here. He's also a founding member of Tim and Elite and a professional runner for Adidas um, and a couple national championships as well as a professional runner. Um, which events have you been national championship in? Just remind me, I know. Uh, two mile and then yeah. uh, 5K on the and 5K, yep. yeah. So um, just lots of great accomplishments here, much many other accolades, but um, I it were just, uh, it's a great conversation to have here today, excited about it. So because I know Drew well, I wanted to prepare and get other people to know Drew. So I thought of like five or six running questions that I have never asked Drew and we've had lots of conversations. Um, so some of these, uh, you know, softballs, pretty easy ones, but I wanna see what your answers are to these. So, um, all right, favorite race you've ever run? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I, you know, I, I struggle with this. I think my most memorable one is probably the Penn Relays uh, DMR with my team yeah. because it was with my team. Um, but my personal favorite race or venue was Oslo Diamond League. It's just the best track and field meet I've ever raced in. Like the fans are amazing. I got to race against uh, the Ingebrigtsen brothers. So on their home soil, it was really, really special. And um, yeah, I had a good race too. So any place you have a good race is, is definitely, it's you know, makes the experience better. Yeah. A little trifecta there. That's awesome. All right. Proudest running accomplishment. Um, 
This one may surprise people, but I really think my proudest running accomplishment currently is actually starting Tim and Elite, which I know is not, you know, you know, maybe something people would have thought, but I just look back on what I've done athletically and I'm not so happy with my career. You know, I've had some good moments, but really like having a team around me that, you know, I was a founding member of and able to, you know, recruit and help other athletes continue to live their, you know, professional running dream has been uh, something that I can really look back on and, you know, be really proud of. So I'd say that. I'd say that's very true. Drew Hunter uh, response there. Having no idea there. That's, <laughs> that's great too. Um, all right. Go to pre-race meal. Keep it simple. Um, I just always try to find like a nicer Italian place um, mm -hmm. and I'll, normally get some sort of like spaghetti and meatballs, something like that. Um, if, you know, I'm feeling a little crazier, I'll try a different pasta dish, but most of the time, uh, it's gotta be above, this is make me sound a little, uh, crazy, but it's gotta be above 4.3 reviews on Google. Otherwise I'm not going to go. I don't want to risk getting food poisoning for a race. That's a big rule I have. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. little, little tidbit there. Uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, just something Italian pasta is normally what I'll do. I'm a Yelp guy for figuring that out. And I'm, it's funny, 4.3 is my limit. I won't go to a restaurant unless it has 4.3 stars on yes. Yelp. It's not even just for like, you know, like I'm not trying to, you know, make me sound bougie or anything like that. I really just do not want to get food poisoning the night before a race. And so I'm like, if it has solid reviews and none of them are related to food poisoning, like let's do it. That's awesome. Drew could also be like a chef. Every time yeah. I've like eaten at his house, he just takes really good food and makes it like simple but very good. I every time I'm out in Colorado and Drew's feeding me, I I feel uh, very <laughs> nourished there. So, <laughs> um, all right, craziest thing you've seen or experienced on a run? Oh, that's that's a uh, that's a good question. Um, okay, this is actually a. Uh, kind of a funny one or not a funny one, but you know, the quote that says like, um, if, you know, a tree falls down in the woods, but you weren't there to, you yeah. know, witness this, did it really, did it really fall down? down. I'm, I'm butchering the quote, but everyone, everyone's heard that at some point. Yeah. Um, I was actually on a run completely by myself. No one was chopping down a tree. Uh, it was on a beautiful trail back in, uh, right outside of Virginia and Maryland where I'm from. And, I was just running by and I literally witnessed out of nowhere, just a tree, just completely tip over and fall. And I actually thought of that quote and I was like, wow, like no one else was around me. I was by myself, yeah. no headphones in. Um, and I just thought a lot about, you know, how running kind of creates these experiences where you're by yourself and, you know, you have this, uh, you just get to see so much of the world. It's like when you travel to a city and you can just run around and see so much by, uh, just from your legs. And so I, I, that's what came to mind when you asked that question, because I did think like, you know, I don't know how many people have been out on a run and happened to see just a tree randomly falling down. Um, so it was, it was pretty eerie, but also it was an interesting experience. That is cool. I like that one. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, one thing you never leave home without when going on a run. <sighs> Um, a hat. I, uh -huh. I run every single day with a hat. I mean, as you can see, this is, yeah. this is on most of the time. I just got a really bad haircut. So <laughs> I, I kind of have an accidental mullet right now. And so the hat is even more necessary <laughs> to hide that up. Um, but yeah, I'm at, like, I can't even remember. It's funny. I don't race in a hat. Um, you know, even like sometimes with harder workouts, I'll take the hat off, but almost always I'm wearing a hat at the start of a practice. Um, if it's cold out, a beanie, if it's, you know, nicer out a hat. So I'd say that. That's funny. It's, I was looking at before this, just like your Wikipedia page a little bit too. And I saw this picture of you with super long hair too, and you had a hat on though. So yeah. I, I'd say always. that's always a hat on there yeah. um i pretty much always run in my tin man elite hat those are great hats i they, love they are good hats. Yeah. yeah yeah and you guys even have the dad hats that you have like that's my go-to don't burn my bald head hat <laughs> perfect <laughs> all right now last one a little more on a personal note here all right you're a father now do you hope that your children run uh good question i mean i think like most uh parents like i will never you know or I shouldn't say most parents, but, you know, good parental advice that I've received from other parents is, you know, you don't want to force your kids into doing something. So I think like, I'd like to introduce them to a, you know, a broad spectrum of sports and activities and hobbies and all those things. And like, I would love to support them in whatever endeavor they choose. 
Uh, but I do think, you know, it would be really cool. Um, even less of it, like athletically, I just think it'd be so cool to like run with your kids. You know, uh, I just think that'd be fun. Like, even if they just want to do it for fitness, um, I feel like I'll be running the rest of my life. That's a goal I have is to always, you know, just stay healthy enough where I can at least get out the door for a few miles until I'm really, really old. Um, and so that'd be cool to share that with my, uh, with my kids, but you know, whatever they want to do, like if they want to be basketball players or play the piano, whatever, you know, it's, you know, I'll just be happy that I get to participate in that. As long as they enjoy it. Yeah. But I, um, I was joking the other day, you know, your daughter Ella's, uh, sponsor before I am, uh, you know, with, uh, <laughs> yeah. the advertiser that you did for Tule uh, for, yeah. yeah, that was great. Yeah, no, she's, um, yeah, she's already getting spoiled in strollers. So, uh, yeah, uh, we'll see what's happening next. Nice. Love it. Yeah. So, um, you know, small preview of Drew Hunter here, but, you know, maybe give us a little update. You you know, we were talking more uh, beforehand, like where are you at training? It's Olympic year, you know, that's a big time in running here. Um, yeah. you know, how's training going? What are you most excited for? Um, where, where are you at? When's your next race kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, it is an Olympic year. So, you know, everyone's, freaking out, training really hard, uh, flying to all these races, trying to chase standards. And I've kind of taken the opposite approach this year. Um, I've just kind of bunkered down in Longmont, Colorado, which is 15 minutes outside of Boulder and been mm -hmm. with my family and just putting in a really, really good foundation for the year with a lot of very boring and simple intervals of threshold work, hill repeats, some long runs, um, some faster, you know, 200s and strides and things like that. But I've really kind of, uh, just taken the approach this year that I want to be my best in June. That's when the trials are. And I, yep. uh, don't think I'll do that if I am chasing times throughout the whole year. And, um, so I think that's kind of been my plan this fall. Um, I'm trying new things. I'm racing a track 10 K for the first time in 10 days. And that's, uh, terrifying, but also incredibly exciting. Um, I've only run a few track five Ks, so I'm really just jumping up in distance. But, um, I think that mentally and also physically, uh, having the challenge of a track 10 K will really, uh, set my year up. Well, um, just knowing that I'm doing shorter races the rest of the summer, I think it's a great, uh, idea to have a longer strength based race on the calendar to start. And then you can kind of, you know, fine tune things after that. But, um, yeah, that's kind of the plan. I'll have some races, uh, I'll, you know, two races in April, I'm going to run the BAA 5k and then, uh, Penn Relays, I'm actually going back for a 1500. Um, and then hopefully in May, the big race there will be chasing a fast 5k with a few of my teammates. So, um, yeah, that's the plan. But like I said, I'm, you know, it's Olympic year, people do crazy things and, you know, indoor season, people were running lights out and I've seen this rodeo before where people run so well, and then, you know, they're injured for the trials or maybe they keep the peak going and they have a great year. Like, all the power to them, but mm -hmm. I've kind of taken the opposite approach is I'll let other people make mistakes and I'm hoping to be at my best in June and, um, you know, just really setting up a really, really big foundation. Uh, and, and yeah, and I'm just enjoying, you know, like for me, uh, traveling every weekend and, you know, chasing times, like it gets exhausting. And I had some issues yeah. last year with staying, uh, healthy, uh, illness wise, not actually running, you know, I've, work with Doug a lot. And we, you know, we had a great strength routine last year that really, uh, helped, helped me stay healthy, um, you know, in terms of injuries, but I had a lot of sickness throughout the year. And I think a lot of that had to do with traveling too much and, um, you know, just forcing things and stressors on the body. I had my, you know, first baby. And so I, I think, you know, um, really this year we've just kind of take the methodical approach of being my best in June. And, I just keep, you know, I, you know, you have like the devil on your shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder and the greedy part of me is like, go to these races, you know, just start, start really getting after it in practice. And then, you know, I have a lot of people in my corner that are like, okay, like, what do you really want to accomplish? And it's be your best in June. And that means slow things down. So, um, that's kind of, you know, where I'm at and I'm, I feel really good about it and I feel happy and that's always important. Um, you know, and so I'm just, I'm in, I'm in a good spot and I feel like coach and I have a good plan to, uh, really attack this year. Well, yeah, I, you know, it's so important to have the confidence to know that you can perform and that you got to trust what's best for you. And along those lines of like minimum effective, like you don't have to maximize everything. This is probably a, a theme that we've mentioned almost on every podcast that we've talked about. So hopefully people are starting to get the point of like, man, it's, it's not about 
doing more. It's about doing the right stuff and having the confidence that that's going to work and realize that it takes time and do that. So, um, you know, you mentioned a little bit of, about your injury journey here and, you know, what can you share as an athlete who has had like a journey getting back from injury and, you know, what that takes as a runner and, and how to, how to find that, formula that really helps you to stay healthy because the consistency is such a big part of running. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think, you know, everyone's different, um, can handle different loads, has different life stressors outside of running that, you know, can, or, you know, may, may, or may make your running worse or, or better. Um, I'm fortunate enough where I'm a full-time runner, so I can, you know, structure my day around what's best for me. Um, but I really think everyone has to kind of reflect on that and figure out like, okay, maybe, an extra day off in the week because I work 60 hours is what I have to do. Or maybe, you know, just spending a time uh, cross training one day. So I think, you know, that's the first thing I would say is just be honest with yourself about where you're at and always under training consistently for a long time will win out over, you know, over training for short periods of time. Um, So I'd say that's the first thing, but with myself personally, like I really, I, you know, like I said, last year, I kind of figured out like traveling a lot, running, you know, lots of really hard interval workouts. Um, I just didn't respond that well to it. Um, I may felt good for like a month of the year. Like I had one really solid month of racing early on. Um, but I kind of fizzled out after that. And this year, you know, I think, you know, we kind of took the opposite approach, um, uh, of really, you know, having methodical, easier training, a little bit higher volume with intervals and threshold work, but, um, at a, a lot lower of an intensity, Um, And then knowing, okay, when do we want to really kind of like turn the screw of things and knowing, okay, like I need to be my best in June. So we really shouldn't be getting that aggressive until, you know, end of April, early May even. Um, Because like I said, you know, everyone's different, but I respond really, really quickly to intervals and faster workouts. So if I do two or three pretty aggressive track sessions, like I'm ready to go. But if I don't have a great foundation and base behind that, yeah. It, I'll bleed pretty quick, uh, meaning I'll run maybe one or two good races and then things will start to kind of fall apart. And so, um, you know, everyone has a different formula. And I think, you know, it's one of the great reasons why you have a coach and you have other people in your corner to like compare things to and look back on. And um, for me, it's just been, you know, trial and error, I would say, of last year trying a new training system, which I'm proud to have done. You know, I, I don't want to look back on my running career and have regrets about like, Oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. Like I really want to attack things head on and kind of see like what works and what doesn't. And last year we kind of tried a more aggressive interval approach and it just didn't work for me. Um, And so I'd be a fool to try that again this year. Um, So we're kind of getting back to what, you know, I originally was good at and that's strong, like longer intervals, um, a lot of threshold work, hills, Um, you know, a lot of kind of, uh, just, uh, you know, really focusing on being fluid when I'm running, you know, we, we, Doug talk a lot about gate stuff. And, um, I think a big thing for me is like, when I feel like I'm, you know, when I feel like I am fluid and running well, uh, things start to click and I can be really good. And when I start to feel rigid and tight and locked up, um, my running kind of also, it gets locked up. So, yeah, I, you know, I think it's it, it's a good question and it's a good, you know, everyone has a different formula. And I would say, like, just try different things and see what works yeah. for you and and don't be afraid to fail. You know, like I, last year, I feel like for me, it was kind of a big failure, but it uh, really this fall gave me um, a really good idea about what I wanted to do this year. And, and, and I'd say that's a win in and of itself. Yeah. Lot, I mean, lots of good stuff in there. Thanks for sharing. I, you know, one of the th- like a couple of things that stood out to me, like stress is stress. And Mm -hmm. there's training stress and there's psychological stress and there's life stress. And if you're training that hard and you're getting sick because you're traveling, like you have to consider the travel as a stress with that stuff. It's all created equal by your body. Your body doesn't know it, it. you know, might just view it as simply as, well, that's a lot of heartbeats to do that. (laughs) It's a a run or getting on an airplane, right? You're going to, you're increasing your heartbeats in some way or another there. So yeah. um, The other thing, like the analogy, which you talked about with your current strategy, um, I've used this, and I think we've even talked about this, where the bank analogy, Mm -hmm. you need to deposit 
and make deposits in the bank as much as you can with your training. And that's the consistency, that's the hard efforts, that's the quality sessions where you're just putting money in the bank. And yeah. then you've got these events where they take money out of the bank and you're pull it, you're deposit, you're withdrawing and you need to have some time to put some money back in the bank or else that bank account runs down and you're in trouble. And I, yeah. that's always an analogy. I think you and I have talked about that in the past. And and one that I use for runners, I think is helpful because you got to make sure that you're putting enough in the bank. And if your bill is too big, like that's probably not a good yeah. race for you to do there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah uh, Morgan Housel has a great book called The Psychology of Money and mm. basically talks a lot about how like just the longer term you look and the longer you, you know, do invest your money in, you know, very simple things like, you know, like an index fund, like you're going to win out in the long term. But if you look at it as like a year or two year process, it's basically a slot machine. You're gambling, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I think running is very similar to that where this year I kind of was like, oh, June, maybe 12 months away. But if I start doing some crazy intervals in, you know, in October of 2023 or whenever I get started in running, I, I just don't know if I can make it there and I don't know if I can make yeah. it there successfully. And so, you know, like if I, I, I mean, people can follow me on Strava. Like, I mean, I'd say there's almost every good high school kid across the country could work out with me. Most of my interval days, you know, I'm running five minute mile pace for, you know, maybe a lot of volume, but that's not anything flashy. I mean, this is, I'm trying to race, uh, at 350 mile pace. So, you know, it's, it, it is a very interesting kind of approach, but, um, I think, you know, it's just kind of like you just said, it's, uh, you got to pay those dues and you got to, you know, make sure that the bank is, um, sitting pretty when you want it to, when you want to really make a deposit, which would be something like an Olympic trials race, you know, yeah. or the Olympic games, like those are when you really want to cash in. Um, and so, uh, that's kind of, you know, like the approach this year and I hope that it works out and, um, but I feel confident in that. And so regardless, you know, I can, um, you know, show up to the starting line in June and be proud of what I did. And that's at the end of the day, that's efforts all you can give. And, you know, that's, that's the only thing that matters is, you know, how, how much, you know, I can put out there. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, well, I know we'll all be cheering for you here. You got uh, cheering squads of that. It's going to be exciting to see. It's 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 an exciting year to really follow running. And Olympic years are the years that running is most popular. So yes. that's uh, it's always fun to see. There's a lot more anticipation and uh, coverage around it. So it's always fun to to see. And then I think even going into the next Olympic cycle, with it being in the United States, like there's going to yeah. be even more um, prestige around some of that. So now the other thing that you brought up in the injury journey, journey there that I think is really important. Um, you're also a founder for Hammer and Axe, right? Mm -hmm. uh, coaching and, and coaching yeah. is a big part of what you do. And, you know, this is kind of a leading question here, but I'll ask it this way anyway, right? You're like, you're uh, a very knowledgeable person when it comes to running. You're a coach yourself. And what you said at the end there was like, your coaches are a really important part of this. Like why? And it's, it's funny. And I think people who don't always realize that, you know, the top professionals have coaches, but yeah. recreational runners seem to think they don't need a coach. So yeah. it's like, you know, where does that mindset come from and, yeah. and what do we see? And then how do we fix that? Because I, like, I mean, mm -hmm. you hit the nail on the head, right? Your coaches are going to be the ones that are going to help you figure some of that stuff out. So what are people missing? Like, why should, why should runners get, uh, yeah. get coached here? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I've been a professional for coming up on nine years. I've been a high level runner for over a decade. Uh, and I've always had a coach or someone in my ear, you know, like I, 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 you know, I, I say this all the time at practice. Like I love, you know, the X's and O's of running. I love writing out a good training plan. I love, um, you know, talking about certain workouts that we could do, uh, more than, you know, the guys on the team get so annoyed with me. Um, cause I'm, I, I love, you know, talking, uh, talking nerdy about all that stuff. So, um, <laughs> but the reason you have a coach is because the deeper you get into the sport, the more you realize how little you actually do know. And you need someone to actually, you know, check your ideas and check your biases and check, you know, what you've always done. 
Um, I think the best example of that is last year, like we had a completely new strategy and it didn't work out. Um, and I, had I been just coaching myself, I don't know if I would have known where to turn or if I don't know if I would have had someone to properly sit down with at the end of the year and say, what did we do right? Let's at least acknowledge those things. You know, I stayed healthy. I had some, you know, success in terms of practice and, you know, like what new interval records and things like that. But clearly the race result didn't reflect what we wanted. Um, and that's why you have a coach. Um, it's that conversation. Like coaching is a relationship and it's something that, uh, you know, the deeper you get into your career, you should also get deeper with, you know, your coach and that kind of like relationship of trust. Um, but also, you know, knowing that like both of you want what's best for, you know, your running career and having someone else to kind of like check those, you know, biases and things that maybe you're missing, um, is incredibly important. Um, and I also think, why professional athletes have a coach, you know, a simple answer is we just overcook ourselves. Um, I know it sounds funny, but like, I always say like, I think I could maybe write a good training plan for myself. Oh, I think I could maybe, you know, get 80%, 90% of the way there. Sure. Um, but I also am, you know, the one saying I need to be ready in June and be patient that's my mom telling me that most of the time. It's not me. You know, like I said, I'm the one that's kind of like, Oh, let's, you know, I really want to work out with Sam today. He's got a 1500 coming up. I love running fast, you know, like, and I need yep. to be responsible enough. And like I said, without a coach, I may take the bait. Um, it's yep. always good to have, you know, uh, to have someone with you or traveling with you to really, you know, hold you accountable to be the best version of yourself. And I think, you know, same thing with the coach. Um, it's just really, really good to have someone that will check you on those things. And, um, yeah. unfortunately I have a whole training group of guys and, um, that are very, very mature and responsible. Like I look at what Reed and Connor did in this marathon buildup and like, they were so under trained compared to what other top us marathoners were doing truly like mileage wise, interval wise, like they, I mean, everyone's on Strava, you can see what people are doing and they showed up and they had the best race, you know, two guys in the top 15, Reed in the top 10. Um, and it was, you know, inspiring for me to see that because it was kind of like, oh, that's kind of what I'm trying to do this year, you know, with the track is like, I've watched all my competitors run wicked fast this indoor season and I have to be, you know, confident enough in my, uh, journey and having a coach to kind of guide you that step of the way and instill confidence in you and really kind of make you believe in the system that you guys have, you know, worked on together is, is vital. That's huge. Yeah, I, there's so many benefits. I, I just running is perceived to be simple. But yeah. In reality, it's very complex. Yes. Yeah. And there's so much intricacy of running. Mm -hmm. And listen, some people do just want to experience it. Of mm -hmm. I put my shoes on and I run three miles three days a week. Yeah, that's great. Running can be that for you. But if you have any goals around performance or and performance could be not just times, but yeah. completing new distances or doing uh, events, like I think that a coach is so valuable, um, you know, and so I kind of want to put my money where my mouth is with this and Drew and I are <laughs> going to do something a little fun here. So um, we're, I'm going to put Drew on the spot here. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to have a little fun with this. Uh, so I don't know if I told Drew this even or fully explain this here. And we're going to Drew's Drew's a um, coach with Hammer and Axe. And I think it's uh, like they offer great services. I think they do a really good job and they're athletes. You know, we just always see great raving reviews from them and achieving PRs and um, setting goals. And it's it's really fun. And he does. He just said loves the X's and O's of running. So uh, I am turning 40 this year. And I have this probably a little am very probably very ambitious goal that I want to run a sub five minute mile every year in my forties. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, let's do it. Originally, I said that I was going to run like a four fifty one this year and give myself a second every year, so that by the mm. time I turn fifty, like I yeah. run like a five minute mile or something. Um, but no, I, let's actually start with a four fifty nine mile, and let's get faster as you get older. Come on, I let's like just, it. Yeah. See? This is why I need a coach. I need a coach to help me set obtainable goals in the first place here that it's like, um, so I, we wanted to do something fun that would be pretty cool. Like have Drew kind of 
and just be my coach and put together and maybe even um i know we should have said this before but maybe you can even share your screen and like we might put a plan in i put myself as an athlete in and hammer and axe but maybe you can even um at the bottom there's a present button there if you hit that and we'll see if we can share your screen here and we'll bring up the run dna app but maybe while you're getting some of that i'll give a little background about like where i'm at right now yeah that's what um, I mean. yeah. and kind of like where i'm starting so uh i some of you knew that it followed me on social or things like that i had an injury this past summer and that was i partially tore my patellar tendon I had like I hit my knee on the ground pretty hard saying goodnight to the kids when I when, uh, jumped on my back and I hit it and there was so kind of a, a little eccentric load toward the tendon uh, I had to try to be really smart about not uh, running for a while even I was with Sam and St. Moritz like one of my favorite places in the world to run and I had to not run um, so I've just slowly come back and what I've focused on coming back is I realized I was going to run uh, kind of really slow for my normal paces anyway. So I might as well get something out of it. And mm -hmm. so I started doing all my running with just nasal breathing. So I just did everything just to really force me to stay more in that zone too. Um, so that was, I probably started that back in late September, early October when I was getting back to running a bit. And then I started to then um after that point i just kind of built up and it was i literally was yeah you know, i went from normally running 750 to eight minute mile pace to running 10 30 to 11 minute mile pace just yeah. trying to stay in zone two and keep my heart rate low enough and not pass yeah. out on the run there um but now i'm up to the point where you know running like 8 45 to 9 with nose breathing only there and i've increased my efficiency a good bit i'm only running this is we're going to talk about minimum effective dosage here i'm running like 15 to 20 miles a week uh yep. within the last three weeks i just started a little bit of speed work Okay. My birthday is in June, so about three months from now, but it doesn't have to be on my birthday. Just in my 40th year here, okay. I, I need to run a, a sub five minute mile. And um, I just started a little bit of 400 stuff where I was literally my first time I did three by 400. And then I did, uh, now I'm doing like two sets of three by 400. And nice. kind of descending, the first one is normally like 630 pace, six. Um, and then I think I worked down in this last one with the six one, I was probably doing like 445 pace for okay. the sixth rep of 400 meters um, and felt fine, no pain or yeah. anything after it there. How many, how many days a week are you roughly running? You said 15 to 20 miles. Is it yeah, every like other right. day? Roughly, yeah. R roughly, okay. it's like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I um, get a run in. I've been a wimp and just running on treadmills inside because I haven't wanted to to, um, to do too much with that. Um, mm -hmm. But I and then I'll try to get like Sunday is run day. My wife is great and lets me get out for yeah. an hour or so. And I'll typically get seven to 10 miles in depending on the weekend. Yeah. There. Awesome. Right, so we just brought okay. up my here's my calendar on the Run DNA yeah. app. Drew's got it up here, yep. um, and we so we're gonna check out some yeah. things and um, see how to get me running fast. Yeah, no. So I really like the structure that you kind of already presented. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, like I actually, uh, I've actually worked with a few people that have very kind of similar goal to Doug, like a sub five minute mile or just something you know. Uh, that's a little bit more of a short dist middle distance type race. Um, I think, you know, a lot of uh, recreational runners, they're like, oh, I just want to run a marathon every year. And that training looks vastly different than what we're doing, than, you know, what we would do with uh, you, Doug, just because you actually got to run fast. You know, you have mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, actually learn, you know, the mechanics of what sub five minute mile pace feels like. And we have to practice that somewhat regularly. Um so I'd say the first thing that, you know, I like the structure of what you're kind of doing is, you know, tentatively, I'd like to get you up to five, six days a week of running. Um, 
what people think when they first hear that is holy cow. But three of those days will be very, very easy jogging. Um, just getting out, you know, like you said, even if, you know, like you're just nose breathing, like I don't care. It can be a trot. Like I don't, like it doesn't matter. Um, how I look at training is those are the days that you absorb the hard workouts. And so, um, you know, for me, like those are also the days, like I, I'm a professional athlete. Like I love having a day where I can just jog, listen to a podcast, enjoy the beautiful scenery around me. Um, and I think, you know, for you, Doug, you're, you know, a CEO of a company and, you know, you have a lot of things, you have kids, you have a lot of stuff on your plate. Like for anyone, you know, that's listening to this and going, Oh my gosh, five, six days a week. Like I want you to know, like a lot of that, most of that running is easy um, and very conversational. So I'd say the first thing we would do is, you know, like if we're looking at a Monday to Tuesday week, I would just put in starting on a Monday, some sort of just easy run. So like, you know, for Doug, like I would say where he's at right now, maybe a 30 to 35 minute easy run. And like I said, that is, you know, something that I personally think is a great way to start the week. It's not something that you're like, have hanging over your head on the weekend. Like, Oh man, on Monday, I have this 400 meter interval workouts. I got to, you know, I, I would think it's, you know, hard to start the week that way. So just an easy jog would be a great kind of first kind of day to, you know, really get things going. Um, Tuesday, I like to have my, uh, workouts on Tuesday. And so we're going to keep that, you know, structure in, um, for Doug, I think a great kind of workout, when you're training for the mile is some sort of, uh, faster intervals, but I also love to have some Doug doing some hill repeats to start. Like I said, we've got a long year. If you're, if you're turning uh 40 in June, um, we don't need to do anything crazy right now, but I really love like a simple workout. Something that I would get started with Doug is something like hill repeats. Um, and I think a great one to start would be something like eight by 30 second hill repeats, with jog down rest. Um, I think this is, these are great because, uh, hills, you can kind of make them as hard or as easy as you want. You know, you can change the grade, you can, you know, really slam the hill. Um, you can also just kind of have it be more of like a up tempo kind of stride day if that's what, that's how you're feeling. Um, but to get things started out, you know, in this first week, um, I think, you know, a great kind of first kind of Tuesday workout would be a good solid warm up some hill repeats in the description of the workout. It says, let's start at maybe 5k or 3k effort. And you can slowly ramp those down to, um, you know, closer to your mile effort. I want to let everyone know listening, um, with a hill repeat, you don't have to run the pace of the interval necessarily. Um, I think some people get confused. They think 30 second hill repeats at mile pace. That's really hard. That is pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, we would like to do that on the track. (laughs) But since you're on a hill, we we can slow things down a little bit. Um, and as Doug so knows, the effort hills, would be like mile effort, um, yes. And the pace is more just uh, whatever the pace is, because it's going to depend on the incline exactly. of the hill and yes. your footing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So something like that is a really kind of good, um, you know, uh, good kind of workout. I love starting new runners and people kind of coming back from injury on hills because there's just kind of misconception that hills are like really hard on your body. Um, but actually like running up a hill is one of the best things you can do for your mechanics. Um, and also, you know, uh, it's, I feel amazing the day after hills, believe it or not, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm sore and tired, but I feel like I've got a little pep in my step and some pop in my stride. And I think, you know, there's something that early on in the training plan with Doug, we'd love to incorporate, you know, hills, um, Wednesday day off. So, mm-hmm. you know, just with where Doug's at, um, I don't, I'm not crazy about the idea of you having three run days in a row rest day. What does that look like? Um, different for everyone for Doug, that could be a walk after, you know, work with his family. It could be a bike ride with his kids. Um, it could also even be if Doug, you know, has a really good, you know, Peloton in the basement or whatever it may be flushing the legs for 30 minutes. I don't really care. Uh, my rule with a rest day is it's restful and that's different for everybody. It's, uh, a day that makes you feel rejuvenated and helps you kind of work through the kinks and maybe the soreness that you have in the previous day. Um, so like I said, some sort of rest day would be good for Doug Thursday. We're coming back to just an easy run. Um, so after a rest day, I don't love, uh, you know, doing, um, you know, 
a hard workout right after a rest day. I like to have some sort of easy run down the line. We may mix in some strides for Doug, but like I said, we're just starting out. So we're keeping the yeah. easy runs pretty easy. So another thing, 30, 35 minute easy run, just like Monday. And then Friday would be the second workout of the week. And when I say workout, I mean, obviously you're going for a run. That's a workout, but I'd say, you know, more of, uh, you know, a workout that your heart rate's up a little bit more, you're mm -hmm. running a little bit faster. Um, and you know, it's a good opportunity for you to, uh, think about, you know, kind of like, this is, this is the, uh, the workouts of the week that are, you know, helping me develop the skills I need for a good mile race. Um, and so, you know, on Friday, I, there's so many workouts that I love to start with. Um, and you know, I know Doug maybe, or maybe not loves to do these. I like to start with most of the athletes I work with, with fartlicks. Um, a fartlick mm -hmm. is a Swedish term for speed play. It also gives just like the hill repeats, a lot of freedom for yeah. the athletes to kind of pick and choose, um, you know, paces and efforts based on where they're at. Say Doug's feeling had a hard day of work on Thursday and he's just a little tired. You can still get in the volume of a great workout, but yeah. not beat your body up in a ridiculously hard way. Um, so for Friday, I love, you know, there's so many different workouts, but we're going to start with a pretty simple one for Doug. Cause like I said, when I'm just taking over the, his training. I don't want to get him injured. We want to keep, Starting you know, basement level here. This is like, yeah. I just, you know, don't want to turn into a slow old man here. Exactly. Um, so something like this 12 times minute on minute off, um, in a 40 minute run is a great way to kind of, you know, get in a little bit of faster volume, work on, you know, developing your aerobic capacity for the mile race and, um, you know, not overdoing things. So, you know, how this works is I'd have Doug warm up 10 to 15 minutes, and then he would either change shoes or keep his trainers on. And he would run one minute efforts at, in this workout description, it's around 5k effort, one minute at 5k. And then he would jog the following minute at just an easy run jog pace. And he'd do that 12 times. And so it's a 24 minute workout. It's 12 minutes of quality, but 24 minutes total. Um, and then after he finished, he jog about five more minutes and get to, you know, 40 minutes total on the day. And it's a great kind of, you know, way to introduce some faster running. But also, like I said, you can pick and choose, like say one of the, one of the minute reps is up a hill. He would obviously run slower than the previous, uh, you know, previous rep. Say he's on a track. They might be a little bit more consistent across the board. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of, you know, what I would like to do, um, Saturday, same thing, rest day, day off. Yeah. I, you know, we don't want Doug running more than five days a week right now. Um, so we're yeah. going to keep it there. Uh, I also think for a lot of people, you know, that are working full time, Saturday is a good day to, you know, not have to stress about running. And, you know, it's a great kind of time to, you know, just be with your family or whatever you may be doing. Um, and then finally, Sunday, some people's favorite day of the week, Sunday, I always love to have a long run. So one run that's longer, but easier for a lot of athletes. Mm -hmm. um, and so for Doug, where we're at right now, that would probably be 45 to 50 minutes. I'm not entirely, you know, set on what, what that looks like. Um, but for, you know, in the, in the range of, you know, something like that. So 45 to 50 minute long run. Um, I always like to tell people how I look at long runs. They are, they can be faster than an easy run pace. If you feel good and you feel like things are trending in the right direction, they also can be roughly the same pace as an easy run. It's more about the time you're out there than the distance you cover. So, you know, for someone like Doug, 45 to 50 minutes, like we'd love to get that up to, you know, 75, 80 minutes, you know, um, you know, when he's in the big thick of, you know, getting ready for a mile. Um, but that's, I'd say kind of a similar week structure, um, how we will build on this. And Doug, do you want me to fill out, you know, four weeks of what a build of this might yeah, look like? Yeah, we do. Do you see the new uh, copy week function there? That's yes. a new one. Yeah. So uh, yeah. maybe we just do, um, um, uh, you hit it on the 11th. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so if you uh, close this one out and go to the 11th or so. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, yeah, hit that button and then you can copy it to the next week and then that will, um, 
Or Which, copy to the 18th. Yep. So that's all set. And then you hit Great. copy and then yeah. it'll go. So then you can see just, uh, you know, yeah. what do you think? Like, how do I progress it for the next yep. four weeks here? Do, um, yeah. you know, what do we change? How steady should I be? You see yeah. like the training load on the right side there. Like, how do we progress that too? Yeah. So, you know, with someone like, you know, Doug, we want to progress with, we'll call it, aggressive intention, uh, meaning we want to, you know, we don't want him doing the same thing all the time. And we want to get up to, you know, where he's doing intervals at five, you know, five minute mile pace and things like that. But we want to be intentional about it and not overdo things. And that's actually where the, you know, uh, the training load in run DNA app is great because it kind of checks me as a coach where I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm not, you know, overdoing things. So I want to keep his easy runs the same. And I want to add up his interval workouts to make those a little bit longer in his long run. This is one of my uh, kind of like hacks, if you want to call it that for coaching is I, I don't love increasing the volume of easy runs and workouts at the same time. I think choose one or the other. So for someone like Doug, I want to get him up to, you know, doing two hundreds at five minute mile pace some three hundreds, things like that. So I'm going to focus on those Tuesday and Friday workouts as the things that we're going to increase the load in rather than, okay, Doug, let's get you up to 40 or 45 minute easy runs. Let's keep those easy runs easy. Let's keep them in your structure. Um, But let's make sure that, you know, we have a solid progression about what we're doing. Um, So what I would do with this week is, you know, I want him to do the same simple hill repeats, 30 seconds, but let's add two. Um, This same thing, this is a, you know, like I said, this is a 12, uh, 12 minutes of fartlek work. Uh, Let's keep it at 12 minutes, but let's lengthen the rep and let's lengthen the time that he's out there. So I added a six times two minute on one minute off fartlek. So it's still 12 minutes of fartlek work, but he's running now the same intensity for two minutes instead of one minute. So like I said, we're slowly adding a little bit more of the volume and the intensity. And then for the long run, let's get Doug up to doing a 50 to 55 minute long runs, long run this weekend. I love the, um, uh, I love the ranges for these because I think it gives, you know, a little bit of autonomy to the athlete to be like, oh, I feel good. Let's, let's get to 55 today, or let's do the same as last week. I had a good week of intervals. We don't need to overdo things. Um, so I think, you know, that's really, really important. Um, so let's copy another week and then we would, uh, same thing. I am now going to start to add in uh, flat intervals for Doug. Um, one of my favorite kind of transition workouts is doing hills. And then I think actually Doug has witnessed me do this in, in Delaware with him. Um doing a hill repeats and then coming to the track and really working on developing those fast switch muscle fibers and, um, race fluidity. So I love to do something like this. Here we go. Um, and add in a little bit of a threshold work. So this is a workout that I like to use a lot. He does six 200 meter hills. So like he's basically been doing, then he takes a bigger break and he runs six 200s on the flat. And then afterwards, We have a mile at threshold. So I want to slowly start to increase kind of, okay, he's doing these, you know, track workouts, but we still need to develop, you know, his aerobic engine. I don't know the exact percentage, but a mile is like an 80% aerobic race. So it's, we want to, you know, make sure that Doug is strong and fast. It's one of the cool things about a mile race is you're kind of touching on both, both of those things. Um, and so, you know, like I said, this is just a workout I like to do. Um, we are going to move this. Reason I picked a mile for my goal <laughs> because it forces me, like, you have to have some aerobic condition. Yep. You have to have like some speed. You have to like, you know, uh, we haven't talked about, you know, I'm still going to get in the weight room twice a week kind of with yep. some of this stuff and, and make sure that I'm doing that. It forces me to be a pretty balanced athlete yep. with that too, which is why I think the mile is pretty cool with that. No, I completely agree. I think it's, uh, I don't know. I always tell people, I'm like, you don't need to slog around at marathon pace and all these other things like have fun, run a little yeah. bit less than you would head to the track, do some 200 repeats. You know, I think a mile is a great kind of thing to train for. If you're just like, 
you know, I, I'm, I, I just want to be an overall kind of well-rounded athlete. Like Doug just said, we could throw in some lifting stuff that would really help you and, you know, any sort of these, you know, sort of little things. Um, so just the other things I added real quick, we increased him again. So this is the last fart lick I kind of like to do before we start real intervals, five times, three minutes on one minute off. So as you can see, we actually added three minutes of training load, but also we added, he's running a little bit longer. So, and like I said, you know, these fart licks vary, um, for someone like Doug, if he's running on a hilly route, you know, somewhere, the pace is kind of irrelevant. Like I said, on all these, I want him to lock into more of, you know, a threshold to start and then kind of get closer to 5k kind of effort towards the end of these fart licks. Um, I don't really like the idea of being like, Doug, you have to run K repeats at 5k race pace. And then Doug gets out there and he goes, man, I'm not feeling it today. I'm just a little sluggish. I didn't sleep well last night. All of a sudden your mind kind of starts to tell you, oh, that was a failure of a workout. In reality, if he had just done a fart lick and said, I'm just going to go off effort, he could have been running slower than 5k pace, but he would have been happy with how it was going. And he's still developing those training systems that we want to develop. Um, we increased the long run by a little bit. That was the only other thing. So I'll do one more week of kind of, you know, what training would look like, just so you guys had an idea of how this kind of works and what, you know, uh, we kind of like to do with athletes. Um, so we're heading into April, April 1st. Um, I would maybe give him a day off for April fool's day, but then tell him really late at night or something like that, <laughs> that he actually has to run. Um, I'd send him a text at like 8 PM and say, dude, you have a run and run DNA, get out there. Even I, get out there. Day off. <laughs> um, I actually had, I actually told my mom for our team, this is a little side tangent, but it's funny. I told her on April 1st, to put in a ridiculous workout for our team in nice. our training logs and yeah. just not say anything until we show up to practice and then see if any of the guys, cause a lot of the guys in our team are like crazy about that stuff. They're like, Joan, what are you doing? What, what is this? And so we'll kind of mess with them a little bit. So we'll see if she does it, but be I'll be nice to Doug and won't do that. Um, so I, I think, like I said, Doug's three weeks into this, he has a good foundation of things. I want to, kind of maybe start to test and see where, you know, how, how does, how does a longer interval at kind of mile race pace feel like, feel like. So let's just do one of my favorites, six, four hundreds at goal mile race pace. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, this isn't showing the descriptions, but all these have bigger descriptions about warm up, you know, yeah. efforts, all the things like that. I'm just showing you the calendar view, but six, four hundreds at goal mile race pace. So for Doug, Five minute mile race pace, that's 75 for quarters. So let's just say for him, we would want to run maybe just start at 75s and hopefully by the end, maybe be a little bit quicker. Um, the rest of these ones, I believe, is two minutes. So um, that's all, you know, that's a harder workout. Like you're going to be tired by the end, you're going to be working a little bit harder. And I'm okay with that. That's yeah. kind of the goal that we have is, you know, we want to get used to, you know, those longer runs at, um, you know, your goal mile race pace. Um, but something I do want to be cautious of is how it will maybe feel later in the week. So mm -hmm. I don't want to get too greedy and have two really big aggressive workouts, um, you know, in the same week, especially with building up and, you know, getting, getting just started in this training plan. So we may on this day really kind of do some lighter intervals, um, I also love kind of just like a simple tempo run. Um, that's something that I do with a lot of athletes. So for someone like Doug, I will put in a 20 minute tempo run. What a tempo run is, is we actually just put up something on hammer and ax, but it's has a lot of different names. People throw it around, but a tempo run should be close to your marathon race, maybe a little bit faster for some of you. And it's just mm -hmm. a continuous uh, run. So Doug would do something like a 15 to 20 minute warm up. And then he would go start his 20 minute tempo run and he would run that at whatever his pace that's assigned is. So for, you know, um, you know, for someone like Doug, that would be, like I said, significantly faster than mile and even 5k and even a little bit slower than threshold pace. Um, but it's enough where your heart rate's up. You're not, you know, I, I always like to tell athletes, you could have a conversation with someone but it would be a sentence or two. And then you would kind of want to stop talking. That's a good metric for it. Um, and yeah, I think this is a great complimentary workout to, for something like the mile where you're still developing your aerobic system, but you're not beating up your body too much. Um, and like I said, the freedom of a tempo run, you don't have to do it on a track. You can just go to a beautiful trail, 
You can yeah. do it on a road, wherever. Um, and then the last thing we would do is, like I said, let's just bump up his long run. Like I said, I want to get him up to close to 75, 80 minutes. So another bump up to uh, 60 or 65 minutes um, for someone like Doug um, would be, you know, a good kind of start for him. So, yeah, like I said, that's four weeks. You know, this is very, uh, you know, with a lot of the Hammer Next clients, we're doing this, but we're having lots of conversations beforehand. But I think this is a good template for someone to get started on and kind of see, you know, what, uh, how things are feeling. You may have, um, you know, setbacks during this where you're sick one day or, you know, things like that. But I really think this is a good structure to at least kind of, you know, get going on things and start to really kind of develop, um, you know, a little bit more of, uh, you know, just get ready for a mile race. And like I said, a mile is a fun race to get ready for because it is, you know, strength and speed. And so I think, um, you know, this is a good kind of plan to get started um, with, you know, someone like Doug, I'd love to, you know, have at least six weeks before we give it a real good crack at a mile. Um, preferably more like eight um, is kind of someone for like this. So this maybe is introductory four weeks I'd want at least two more weeks before we gave it a good crack. And then even probably two more weeks before we did it again. And we might do things like, I love kind of like little time trials or check-ins, you know, where we maybe one weekend Doug does an 800 at faster than mile race pace. And we just see how fast he runs. Um, and that really would help boost, you know, his performance in a few weeks after doing stuff like that. So that's kind of the general structure. Um, but obviously there's a lot more to it than that. Um, so Yeah. That's fun. Yeah, no, Drew, thank you. That's, it's great to see. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing. Uh, like, as Drew was saying earlier, right? Obviously, I have, um, I, ha I, I coach athletes. I, you know, I was once a little more athletic than I am now, but, uh, you know, was athletic at one point. And, but it's still so important to have a coach, right? Yeah. Because it's just like there's all those things. I think sometimes, even when you know a lot about running, it's harder to almost pick, like, where do I want to start? Yeah. Right? Because yeah. exactly like you're saying, it actually, it felt really good to run those 400s. I did yeah. like for the past two or three weeks, yeah. but you know, I do need to be a little more foundational. It's not like you can't just jump into some of that stuff. Yeah. It, like you'll chase what feels good and what you think is yeah. good, but running injuries have a four to six week delay. So yes. if you can yeah. get like four weeks of something in and then you have to stop, you're not yeah. making any gains with it. So yeah. it's it's good to have somebody with an outside perspective that's not like, but yeah, I like 400s. Like I want, I want to run some 400s. Like, no, you're not ready yeah. for that. Like you need some hill repeats and you need to just run what feels easy with some fartlek kind of training. I think yeah. that that's it's really important just to get that perspective. I think everyone needs it, uh, you know, and, and maybe this will be a recurring segment <laughs> here where uh, we, we do another month check-in or something. That'd be know, good. Yeah. Is there. That'd be a lot of fun. Let yeah. Maybe what we could do is uh, after this four weeks, we do kind of like a little yeah. bit of a test, like an 800 or a thousand. Yeah. Hey, Doug, you're going to run my, your goal mile race pace and yeah. see how it feels. And then, we can train for a few more weeks after that and give it a real crack yeah. or something. So, yeah. Um, yeah. We can, we'll, that we'll great to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let us know and listeners in the comments, uh, yeah. if that would be interesting for you, we can see if I can, Get it yeah. out there. I, I, it's a shame when you said uh, I won't be ready in time for this, but I was like, oh, he's got pen relays. Like maybe those guys could pace me. <laughs> I could have like, all these professional runners pace me to to this there. But uh, yeah, 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 we'll have to see. Like I don't think I could run this till well after trials or anything anyway. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I think we're safe for a little bit there. But. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, Drew, I th I, this is fun. I think we yeah. should do another one, uh, check up on it and then check some things out there. And, yeah. um, you know, thanks for sharing some of your running story too. I think it's, it's important for people to hear what that's like. And, um, there are obviously differences between professional and recreational runners. So it's kind of nice to have a little like your story and how you're training and what you're doing and the similarities and the differences more on the recreational side. And, yeah. Um, you know, you're just such a wealth of knowledge when it comes to it, that it's, it's really fun just to kind of see what you're doing and, and how you approach things. And, um, 
you know, it's just uh, you have whole Team Adams here as raving fans of you, as well as many other people out of the country. So appreciate your experience and, and your insights there. Yep. Thank you so much, Doug. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, if people, I, what's the best way for people to like follow you and kind of see, like you mentioned Strava or Instagram or like, what's the best yeah. way? Uh, for training stuff, definitely Strava. I post every day yeah. on there. Um, and you can see all the highs and the lows of, uh, you know, workouts that went well, workouts that didn't go well. I'm pretty honest. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'd say that. And then, you know, just anything else, just, yeah. Instagram is, 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 uh, you know, I, I, trying to post more about, you know, where I'm racing, what I'm doing, but, yeah. um, you know, overall, like I just, uh, if you follow the Tim Manley account, they'll post good, everything you need to know about me. So That's awesome. yeah. And even hammer and Axe has a lot of like, you've got some pre-made plans made up or some options to do that. So there's, yeah. there's things that are on there too. Yeah. Uh, if you want to get it delivered to you and, and make it easy, there's, there's some starter programs and as well as some one-on-one. So yep, yeah, absolutely. Very good. Well, well, thanks everybody for listening. Happy running. And uh, thank you, Drew. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Like what you hear? Leave a review of the show wherever you listen. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Run DNA helps runners and running specialists through education and technology to identify each runner's unique injury profile to avoid setbacks and maximize results. The Run DNA podcast is produced by Ace Running LLC. The Run DNA podcast is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision-making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can occur. Always seek the guidance of qualified medical professionals before making healthcare decisions. Find us online at rundna.com.